So the title of my talk is Coherence of Collision States. I was not a student of Hugo Fano. The way he came into my scientific life was uh, in, uh, I met him the first time in London in 1978. There was a symposium, symposium at that time on coherence and correlation in atomic collisions. And I just recently entered that field. Uh, so, um, and Ugo was Fano. Ugo Fano was sitting in the front row in the middle and issuing rather harsh comments on each talk. <laughs> and there was one in particular on coherence that I remember. It was a, a talk by the polarization of in beamforge spectroscopy when you tilt the foil and you can also look at polarization of grazing incidence of ions picking up electrons from surfaces. And the speaker said, if you do this, you create coherence. If you do that, you create coherence. And uh, Fano's remark after that was, Coherence is not something that you create, it's something that you destroy. So this was my introduction to coherence. Uh, I knew, of course, his work. I started out in spectroscopy, so I had used a lot his paper with Joe Masek from 73 in Review of Modern Physics. The, the way of thinking there appealed very much to, to my way of, of looking at things. And uh, also I, I started in 74 um, to work in atomic collisions. Uh, with the wizard in, in Orsay, Michel Barra. And he introduced me to what is now called the Fano Lichten Barra model on molecular uh, orbital promotion. So after this period, for some years, we, we started, uh, well, in various places uh, Copenhagen, Aarhus, uh, Orsay, what we would call quasi one electron systems, very simple systems where you have one electron bound to a center here colliding with something else. Could be beryllium neon, magnesium, helium, so on and look at the simplest excitation from the ground state to the first excited state, the resonance transitions. But um, where we really started to uh, interact uh, was uh, an effect of in, in 1983. I was um, a year a dealer visiting fellow uh, working with Keith Burnett on collisional redistribution of light in thermal collisions. So I found that fascinating that you can only excite the atoms if you have the photon. There's not sufficient energy, of course, in the thermal collisions to have excitation. So uh, we played a lot with that. And there I met <coughs> Gene Gallagher. And at that time, also, Ingolf Hertel was a visiting fellow. So they asked me whether I wanted to collaborate with Ingolf on a review on alignment and orientation in outer shell excitation. I should do the heavy particles. Ingolf should do the electron atom stuff. I knew nothing about that. And that seemed to be somewhat in a mess, so uh, there was a need for a cleanup. And so he asked me whether I would like to do that, and I said no. I came to do something else, uh, so I would not do a review of uh, sort of what I had done in the past. So they said, perhaps you can come back next summer, 84. And so we made the plan, and I thought, yeah, perhaps we should do that. So we said it was, this here would be about 60 pages, and it would take a year, perhaps two summers, to do that. That turned out to be a big mistake. But the way we, we did this was, so I, I went back to, to Copenhagen. I did my experiments there in Copenhagen, in Aarhus, and in Norse, working with various people. Then I went back to Dilla for two times two weeks or one month per year, uh, trying to organize the, the data, uh, interacting with the various groups. They, it turned out that they were all using their own language. So we decided we need a common language. We want to translate everything into that language to see if we can see some kind of systematics. And then uh, Ugo Farmer was very interested in this, so I had, it was sort of my duty uh, going back, not to go straight back to Copenhagen, but to go make a stop, take the first plane in the morning to Chicago. The, the um, plane to Copenhagen is in the evening, 23 o'clock, so we had a day there to talk, so uh, I sort of had to pass a test every time on the way back to report on what we were doing and what the progress was. So that was, uh, turned out to be very interesting. In July, I worked, uh, we're starting with Ingolf Hertel, that was on the, the beginning, laying the framework, uh, working on electrons. Uh, later on with Eleanor Campbell to do the same thing with the heavy particles. And most recently uh, with Klaus Bacher to see what happens if also, if you introduce uh, spin, uh, spin polarized beams. So Ugo in uh, Chicago, also there I met for the first time Emil Sitki and actually several people here in the audience I met for the first time in, in Ugo's office. And then the people back home in, in, in Europe, Sven Jörg Nielsen in Copenhagen, Torkel Andersen in Aarhus in particular, and Daniel Dweck in, in Orsay. Now, as I said, there was a big mistake. We were off by about a factor of 10. It <laughs> um, came out in three reports in physics uh, reports. The first one in 1988, that was mainly with Ingolf Hertel, about 200 pages. 
The next one was in, came out perhaps too late, uh, but we were doing many other things with Eleanor in 1997, also close to 200 pages. The, the slim volume is only, I think it's 150 pages with Klaus Barchat. And that took time because the, the field that we had planned to review virtually did not exist, at least not the conceptual framework we had to create more or less from scratch in, in, to a large extent. Um, some of it is, is still a mess, so what we did was, uh, sort of after sort of the encouragement by, by Gordon Drake, we wrote a book that came out last year on polarization alignment and orientation in atomic collisions, where we spent the first 100 pages on sort of laying the framework, density matrix, spin polarization, and so on. The next 100 pages on showcases, what can you learn from electron atom collisions. Next 100 pages on heavy particle collisions. A uh, couple of um, sort of things related phenomena, but then we have at the end, because this is a very smooth, we think, presentation, and I think this is very easy and obvious. So we took the key papers from the previous 50 years, from 1925 up to 1975, that is stopping 25 years before the modern development, to take the key papers to show the tortuous way that the, where these ideas had developed with uh, Oppenheimer, Penny, Beta, and so on during the time, uh, Percival Seaton, uh, Fano Masek, etc. So my job today is sort of to give you a, 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 I'll say a summary of this because I've, I've tried to not to stress specific results to minimize that uh, as much as possible, but to, to try to show you some of the ideas, some of the concepts, perhaps some of the models that have, have developed during this exercise. So the outline of my talk on coherence of collision state is first introduction, that is what you have just heard. Then briefly the framework on what people call complete experiments, angular correlations, uh, Stokes parameters, density matrices, useful parameters. Then shows some cases of what came out of this, the, the what's called propensity rules. That's a word I learned, as you will see, from one of Ugo Fano's papers. On electron atom collisions, orientation, if you have spin dependence, then it makes sense to generalize the concept of Stokes parameters. You, uh, heavy particles also for orientation, and these, of course, in order to introduce an orientation, you need, or one way to do that at least, is to have planar scattering uh, uh, symmetry. Um, you can also look for um, propensity rules for alignment, and we, I'll show you some, uh, I think, a particular nice example for in electron transfer processes. Uh, then, very briefly at the end, atomic scattering in the diffraction limit another aspect of coherence of collision states, where the key parameter here is the de Broglie wavelength of the beam you play with, and then a the conclusion. So framework. Start with the conservation law, conservation of reflection symmetry. When you have a collision, then the reflect, uh, you have a Conservation reflection symmetry of, uh, with respect to the collision plane for the whole system, the, the target plus the, the uh, uh, projectile. So in the simplest case where you don't change, the, say, the target, then the reflection symmetry of the uh, projectile itself is, is uh, conserved. So if we take the simplest non-trivial example for S2P excitation, starting in an S state, and you say we conserve reflection symmetry. An S state has positive reflection symmetry with respect to the uh, collision plane, the yellow plane. And here I draw the three in, in the helicity basis, the minus one plus zero and minus plus one states. The two red ones here have positive reflection symmetry. So you, the, you can excite to this state and that state from the, the ground state if you don't do anything to the target, whereas you cannot go from the uh, S state here to the P state with M equals zero if you don't do anything to the target. You can do, for example, if you have a spin flip, then you can uh, populate th this orbital here, but uh, you have to do things like that. So for example, if you do an electron scattering experiment, the population of, of this state here is a direct measure of the spin flip cross section. Okay. That's a bit. Yeah, another obvious uh, consequence is when you only populate these two states, that the angular momentum, the angular momentum is perpendicular to the collision plane. A brief uh, reminder of what you learned in, in uh, 
optical or well, the photon emission, di electric dipole rate emission from uh, p states. So when this, uh, I draw here a p state, here's the picture. Here's the top view if you look from the z axis from the direction perpendicular to the uh, collision plane. Now you can do essentially two things. One thing is you can place your detector in the collision plane and measure the angular distribution as a function of the angle with, the, say, the x plane. Then you see an intensity distribution like this. So what you get is exactly the shape of the orbital rotated by 90 degrees. So you have a minimum excitation in the direction of the dipole. So this is a correlation experiment. With, you do correlation measurement with the scattered particle and the emitted photon, which is useful for if you do, say, UV photons. A slightly more powerful method is to look uh, from the direction perpendicular to a collision plane through a polarizer, if that's available for that wavelength, and to measure the, line, the linear polarization, the circular polarization. In this case, you only have linear polarization. So this is kind of coherence analysis. You analyze the coherence properties of the emitted light. Now, a pure p-orbital is a bit boring if you add angular momentum. So that is, you excite also the component in this direction here, perpendicular to the main axis. Then you, this corresponds to having angular momentum. But again, if you measure the angular distribution, you get the shape of the charge cloud. Uh, it, whereas if you measure, if you map out the polarization lips from the direction perpendicular to the beam, you will get um, also the angular momentum. The, the angular momentum of the photons is simply the angular momentum of the, of the, of the um, excited state due to conservation of angular momentum. So the general picture here, if you have uh, an excited P state, is you can get uh, its shape by an angular correlation measurement, and you can get uh, the, uh, also its angular momentum by, by mapping the polarization lips, that is the three Stokes parameters in the direction perpendicular to the plane. So the parameter you get out here, the, the, the degree of linear polarization, gives directly the shape here, so it's a kind of shape parameter. The gamma angle here gives the alignment of the, your, your orbital with respect to the, say, the beam axis. And over here, the, the two linear Stokes parameters and circular polarization, the third one, the angular momentum, it is except for the sign, depending on your sign convention, uh, the, the um, expectation value of the angular momentum perpendicular to the collision plane. Now, the, this angular momentum is not, uh, it, and, and the shape parameter here, they are not independent. If, you have, if nothing else is going on, then uh, the Stokes parameter here is, or the Stokes vector is a unit vector, so the sum of the squares is equal to, to unity. And you can, to see the connection then with the, what Ravi talked about, the density matrix and the Stokes parameters, if you write down the, the density matrix in this, what I call the atomic physics spaces, the helicity spaces, uh, quantized perpendicular to collision plane, you see here that the Stokes parameters are directly the here components of the, uh, the density matrix elements. Uh, the, what enters here is the, uh, well, depending on your normalization, this, is, this here would be the, the total, or the, 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 the cross-section. And here you see the coherence parameters, the Stokes parameters. And you can introduce what I, I did before, the alignment and orientation parameters, the angular momentum as a measure of the orientation. The gamma angle is a measure of the alignment. And the linear polarization is a, is a, a measure of the shape of the charge cloud. So you see they enter here. In, in this way, so you have a direct interpretation of the, ele the elements of your density matrix in terms of the shapes uh, of the, your charge cloud and the Stokes parameters. You can write down the, the wave function. I found that was, was interesting, but talk that to, what's to Hugo Panos. He said, who's interested in the wave function? <laughs> but I was brought up in the, the, in the uh, spirit that the ultimate thing for an experimentalist to do is to, what's, what Ben Peterson called the, the complete experiment. So it, if you were able to design an experiment or a set of experiments where you could determine the wave function itself, then you had sort of reached the end. If you had agreement between theory and experiment at that level, that was it. That was as far as quantum mechanics would allow you to go. So you see, this is very much in the, in the spirit of this paper here, uh, fundamental paper by Fano and Masek, where you say the idea is to disentangle geometrical and dynamical effects and stress the extraction of data on the alignment and orientation of radiating atoms from observations of the emitted light. So now we will see what we can learn from this approach when we look at um, uh, electron atom and heavy particle collisions. And the topic I've chosen 
based on uh, obvious encouragement was uh, propensity rules. So there's a short paper, I think it's one page from 85, uh, on propensity rules, and that was sort of my introduction to this uh, concept. I'd learned about it from the chemist, but I wasn't quite sure what it meant. So here he says, the concept of a propensity rule has been introduced with reference to a transition or to a class of transitions, which is much more likely than alternative but accessible ones. And then it comes, propensity thus amounts to an attenuated version um, of a selection rule. Selection rules result from exact symmetries or other properties of a system. For example, this forbidden transition of the, uh, the population of the dipole perpendicular to the scattering plane or was it in the selection rule. Propensities uh, from less clearly identified circumstances. So the, the challenge is, of course, to see if you can shed some light on these less clearly identified circumstances. So let us start with election and atom collisions and see what kind of questions can you ask now when you have access to these parameters. So there's a, also a brief paper by Komoto and Fano from 1981 discussing uh, electron atom collisions. So here you have the P vector of the incoming electron. Here you have the UX excited P state. And they think in terms of attractive forces, where you have scattering here to the left, or repulsive forces, where you have scattering to the right. And they discuss the sign of the induced angular momentum here of, of the P state, the orientation, whether you scatter here to the left or to the right. Now, if you think of an S2P excitation, in the simplest case, use the first one. So here's the, the K vectors, the incoming K vector, the outgoing K vector, the momentum transfer vector. Then in the first bond, you just give the electron a kick, so that is you create a P orbital along the direction of momentum transfer. So such an orbital has zero angular momentum, and you can, from geometry here, calculate easily the uh, alignment angle. And I'll show you an uh, example for helium excitation. ATEV, electron impact energy, and the energy defect for the 2p excitation, the simplest non-trivial one is 21 electron volts. So uh, this here is the angular momentum, and this here is the alignment for 0 to 180 degrees. So first born gives 0 here, and the gamma angle in the first born is the green line, calculated in the way I showed you before. Now if you look at the experimental points, now there are also lots of theories, but this is sort of a generic curve you have a positive angular momentum for small scattering angles. And then at larger scattering angles, many other things appear. This here is particularly simple. You see a fully oriented state here, almost, and then uh, you have a change of sign, and then it, the electron goes uh, uh, the other way around. And here's the gamma angle. This is very interesting. I don't have time to talk uh, in more detail about this or, or what the models are, but it gives you the a feel for your way, way of thinking. And Ingolf Hertel was intrigued by the fact that uh, it seems that there's a propensity rule that at small scattering angles, you always get a positive orientation for the S2P excitation. So he made a small semi-classical semi model of this. I don't have time to go through the uh, detail of the arguments with you, but it's very simple. The bottom line is that, that you, you really get this, this uh, orientation here, as you would ex uh, expect, or as you see ex experimentally. But also, another consequence of the way, same way of thinking is that you, you, if you use positrons, then you see the opposite orientation for small scattering. So that is the orientation will change sign when you change the sign of the projectile for electron impact. Uh, many more people thought about this. I think the first uh, uh, paper discussing really this change here was by Madison and Winters in, in 81. Uh, there's an interesting, and, and he's, they showed that um, it, uh, the uh, orientation would really change sign. There's an interesting paper from 89 by Si Dong Lin uh, and collaborators where they not only play with electrons and positrons and look at its scaling here, they also compare with proton and anti-proton impact excitation of atomic hydrogen and helium. Now, there's a problem here for comparison because what is, what is the impact parameter for um, uh, electrons? But uh, Shidong found a clever way of sort of making translation and based the scaling law on that. I don't have time to go through that, but that is, uh, uh, you can find a discussion in, 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 the, in the whole book. But there's one interesting, um, consequence that I will spend a little more time on, if you change the sign of delta E, that is you go from excitation to de-excitation of state, then also the prediction is that the induced angular momentum should change sign. 
taken some time before there's been sort of analysis or more work done on this. There was a recent paper in 1998 from Brisbane doing experiments. They start from the 3P state. And then they can interpret their results from the time inverse state, the 3S to 3P, and they see this sign of orientation, though the energy is a little bit too high for this argument to work. For de excitation, they see the opposite sign. And there was a recent analysis by Klaus Bajat doing the theory to, to show that this is indeed the case. But it has not been proven sort of in, as, a, as a general thing. Similarly, there's the recent uh, results from Peter Zetner for the barium. Case also excitation, de excitation, do the same thing. But it's still an empirical um, uh, propensity rule. And you can find exceptions. One exception is if you go to a heavy system like mercury. This is mercury excitation from the ground state to the triplet P1 state at 8 eV. If you use unpolarized electrons, you see the, um, the um, orientation that you would expect from the propensity rule. But if you uh, do the spin resolved experiment, which has been done theory and, and theoretically and experimentally, then you see for uh, if you have spin up electrons and you scatter here to the left, then you see the orientation that you would expect from the propensity rule. If you have spin down, on the other hand, then the electron, the excited electron, moves the other way around if you excite the electron. Because it turns out that this, the mercury doesn't really like this channel here. It, it, uh, for spin down, it would much more like to have spin flip and excite the, the orbital perpendicular to the collision plane. So this is a less likely channel than that, and that means that when you add the two, have the unpolarized beams, then you get the, you reproduce the usual propensity rule. But if you go into details, you see other things like that. So it's an empirical propensity rule, but you may find exceptions. Let me see. Yeah, let me say one sentence what happens if you go and you start to look at um, uh, spin polarization. Here's again the, the, the collision plane, and you can make Stokes parameter analysis in various directions. But now you can also play with spin direction, spin up and down, and you can have in-plane spin forward and, or sideways. So now you have, you have two parameters you can play with, the polarizer and, and the spin. So that means you have four numbers. So you can combine them. Now, for example, in this way, plus, plus, minus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus, minus, plus, plus, minus, plus, minus. Uh, so for a, a fixed setting. So this means that instead of having um, a Stokes vector, you now get for each uh, polarization, or for, uh, for, yeah, for each uh, uh, spin polarization of the electron, you get a 3-by-3 um, get, get a, a th three matrix. So you get a 3 by 3 matrix for each spin, spin polarization, and you get it for, e for each direction. And it's very easy, or reasonably easy, to make um, a, an analysis of this problem to see where, from which directions, which measurements will give you the same information, where can you get new information, and where can you get consistency checks of the results you already have uh, obtained. This is a very useful thing for, well, for also assessing things. You get a different sort of perspective on people's error bars when you try to make these uh, consistency checks that they were not aware of before they published. But also, as an experimentalist as I am, you, now you can analyze where should you drill, drill holes in your vacuum chamber in order to get maximum information out of your experiment. So, so much for, general, for generalized Stokes parameters. Um, yeah, five minutes, okay. Heavy particle collisions, measuring helicity, the helicity of the photons emitted perpendicular to collision plane. If you do that for the one electron systems at near the maximum of excitation, you see a huge difference in the number of photons with uh, orientation following the rotation of the internuclear axis than you see in the opposite direction. This is true near the excitation maximum. You can find ex exceptions to this. So this means, again, that we have a propensity rule. You can go from here to there, here to there. This is forbidden, but this is highly favored at this particular velocity where you have maximum excitation. So what is the physics behind that? Again, I will not have time to go through the detailed um, way of analysis. It connects. I, I, gave it once as, a, as an exercise for my students, and they were able to solve it. For 30 students, they were able to solve it with some guidance. So you can set up the equations here. You can do the first order. And you see here an interplay between the phase of two states that build up with an energy difference delta E. 
And then you have, uh, when you look at the amplitudes for the plus and minus helicity, minus theta and plus theta here, due to the different uh, um, uh, properties on the rotation of the, of the um, uh, spherical states. So it's very easy to see then, if you pick your velocity so, that this uh, term here changes by pi during a collision. Then, since the internuclear axis rotates by pi during the collision, these two, you can get these two to, to cancel each other, so you have a kind of stationary phase. That's, uh, yeah, it looks like the, the Messick criterion. So when you pick your velocity uh, co um, uh, from this criterion here, you have the maximum probability, and all the probability goes into the uh, helicity state with, with minus one. But you can also see directly, if you change the sign of delta E, <coughs> If you go from replace delta E here with minus delta E, the, the two terms will change sign. So this means that if you have d excitation instead of excitation, the uh, the propensity rule will be the opposite, just as we saw for electron impact. My final comments, very brief, is another aspect. Okay. Um, yeah. I, will, I, th I think I will not have time to go through alignment propensities, though they are very beautiful. That's for the, have to ask in the last five minutes. But I'll show you another aspect, some recent results, also on coherence, atomic scattering in the diffraction limit. Electron transfer, lithium ions colliding with sodium now in its ground state for simplicity. If you hit within a distance of 10 atomic units, you have a very high probability for electron transfer. So you capture, and you capture mainly into the ground state. So um, here, uh, on the other side, you have a beam, the matter wave of um, lithium, neutral lithium atoms in their ground state. So according to this, you have, uh, you have your thing in terms of the De Broglie wavelength, uh, the Planck's constant divided by the momentum. So if I teach both quantum mechanics and I teach classical optics. So you should see Fraunhofer diffraction uh, with, so you see a central peak, but you should see a ring structure where the, the width of the rings is given simply by the ratio between the wavelength, the De Broglie wavelength, and the diameter of your atom. So this is Fraunhofer diffraction. Um, if this is hard to see, if you take a typical velocity, uh, 0.2 atomic units, you get a De Broglie wavelength of 150 femtometers very small. So this is a, a ring width of 0 0.008 degrees, and there's a hundredth of a degree. Now a typical beam collimation is, uh, say, 0.3 degrees. That's a factor of 40, too big. You can collimate it down by a factor of, say, perhaps 5. But if you collimate it down to this, you get nothing through. So if you want to see Fraunhofer diffraction, you have to do something else. But you, can, you have an alternative way of estimating the scattering angle, namely as the ratio between the momentum transfer and divided by the momentum. So if you can find a clever way of measuring the uh, momentum transfer here to the ion, then you can estimate the uh, scattering angle. And the, what puts the limit to, to this technique is the thermal motion of your target. So the idea, if you want to go, go to the limit, you put your atom to rest. That is, you laser cool your sodium target. We have done such an experiment, and I just want to show you my final view graph here before the conclusion. Let's put this in the right spot. So here at the bottom, you see the momentum transfer for two velocities, 0.4 and 0.15 atomic units. You can translate this to uh, scattering angles. Uh, so you see here, for a De Broglie wavelength of 75 uh, Fermi, you see the central peak, but you begin to see the first ring here shows up. You go down, to, you increase the De Broglie wavelength to 100 Fermi, you see the ring more clearly, 150 Fermi, 200 Fermi, 225 Fermi. Here you see it very clearly. So this is Fraunhofer diffraction of, of uh, matter waves measured uh, from, the, from the recall ion. So this is another manifestation of the coherence of uh, collision states. So my conclusion of, of this is that studies of 
the coherence of collision states is expressed in terms of the alignment and orientation parameters using the framework outlined by the Fano school yield insight into the collision dynamics that goes far beyond what you can get out of traditional cross-section uh, studies alone. <laughs>